Good evening. This is the, Rill the Ridgewood Village Council Public Workshop. The date is March 23rd, 2023. The time is 7.30. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by a posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, by mail to the Ridgewood News, the record, and by submission to all persons entitled to same as provided by law of a schedule including the date and time of this meeting. Roll call. Deputy Mayor Perrin. Here. Council Member Reynolds. Here. Council Member Whites. Here. Council Member Winograd. Here. And Mayor Vagianos. Here. Will you all please join us in the flag salute? We will now go to public comment. Um, before we do, um, as I do most every week, I would implore everyone to be respectful, bring your passion. Um, the vast majority of you who come to that microphone are respectful every week. And on behalf of the council and the community, I thank you. This is how we get things done. This is how we figure things out. We listen, we discuss, we come to conclusions. It is easy for us to all get along when we agree. Unfortunately, we're never going to agree on everything. But how we disagree determines how we move forward as a community. Will we be united or will we let every disagreement divide us? Let's be that community that others point to as to how we conduct our business. Let's focus on issues, not personalities. Let's avoid the cancer of public discourse that has infected national politics and so many of our communities across the country. Contrary to popular opinion, excuse me, Thank you. Contrary to popular opinion, there are no points to be scored at that microphone. This is where we discuss issues and try to persuade members of the council. I'm not sure about you guys, but I've seen that when someone engages in a personal attack, the subject of that attack stops listening. So let's avoid name calling. Let's avoid personal attacks. It doesn't help us with the issues before us. It is beneath this community. We can all do better, all of us. Thank you. Let's begin. Is the mic on? It is. OK, thank you. Good evening. I attended the budget meeting last Excuse Wednesday. Me. Your name and address. Please. Ann Loving, 342 South Irving Street. Welcome, Ann. Thank you. I attended the budget meeting last Wednesday virtually for the first part and in person for the last. I was and I remain completely dismayed that the council majority, <clears throat> not Councilwoman Reynolds, is considering furloughs for employees of our village. This is the worst idea you have come up with, and I am absolutely disgusted. Even more disheartening was listening to three of you, last week Ms. Winograd was absent, wring your hands and act so dramatically sad at the thought of furloughs, when in fact, you can simply stop this from happening. Your budget discussions included allocating another half million dollars towards Shedler and your myopic determination to shoehorn a huge field onto a not huge property. Your budget discussions included spending $10,000 to hire a person who you initially thought was a lawyer. Now it turns out he's not a lawyer and in fact he has a very, very shaky resume. You wanna hire this man to help you get the historic status 
of the Shedler property overturned so you can smear it with toxic artificial turf, stadium lights, and bleachers. Your budget discussions included spending $60,000 for new garbage cans for the business district. Instead of repairing those that are damaged and putting perfectly serviceable ones that are in storage back into use. You were elected to be stewards of our tax dollars and to manage our village. You're making a big fat mess of this. We're in a financial crisis in this country. There are banks closing, inflation is raging, and a war is looming as a real possibility. And yet you want to cut the salaries via furlough of our employees. As Councilwoman Reynolds has pointed out over and over again, there are simple ways in which you can save the salaries of those who work to keep our village running. Stop the nonsense with Shedler. Put in a small field that was mutually agreed upon. Do not hire a shyster to further your agenda. If you're planning to hire someone for anything at all, please at least do the most basic of background checks before doing so. Do not purchase designer trash receptacles. You're driving this train completely off the tracks and it's horrifying to watch. Please get a grip and do what you were elected to do. Our mayor is known to proclaim in a dramatic yet meaningless way, I understand. Mr. Mayor, I do not understand. And one last thing, this rule of only permitting 12 speakers is so unfriendly. People are racing to get here in order to avoid being cut out. You're actually pitting neighbor against neighbor. I want to hear what everyone is saying. Tell me, Mr. Mayor, why don't you want to hear from everyone? Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Good evening, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to voice my opinion. Uh, my name is Chuck Handy, and I live at 695 Kingsbridge Lane. I'm a block from the Schindler property. Um, I have five children, two now in the high school. And um, I should note that my opinions are not shared by my wife, Mary Louise, as I know many of you know Mary Lou. Um, I was a president of the Maroon Soccer Club for five years, coached for 10 years Maroons. Um, additionally, I coached for the RBA for eight years. And um, with those years, I learned that this town needs fields. It needs full-sided fields. It needs baseball fields. We need to give our youth the opportunity, every opportunity we can, to go out there and play. When rain hits and the fields flood, this is one field I know we'll be able to rely on. Okay, it, it is a high field, the grade is high, and it's not going to flood. We have new apartment buildings in town. We have a, a new parking facility. Um, more and more people are being attracted to Ridgewood. One of the reasons are our youth sports, our school system. When the notion was first brought up for a small-sided field, I was thrilled. When I then found out that without removing any more trees, we could facilitate a full-sided field, let me tell you, I was all in. Um, is, is it going to mean more traffic? Is there going to be a parking issue? I'm, I'm kind of past that. Um, I, I fully endorse putting a full-sided field there, as I know all the sports organizations in town, including the high school, would very much be. And like I said, I, I just live a block from this, this, this beautiful piece of property that I know will turn into one heck of a complex. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Chuck. Also, forgive me, I just had ankle surgery, so. Good evening, Jacqueline Hone, 30 Carriage Lane. Good evening, Jackie. This evening um, on the agenda is policy green amendment and I would just like to read something very quickly 
from the binder. It's an email that Councilwoman Pamela Perrin sends to Heather Maylander, subject Green Amendment to New Jersey Constitution. And in it, it says, every person has a right to a clean and healthy environment, including pure water, clean air, ecologically healthy habitats, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic qualities of the environment. The state shall not infringe upon these rights by action or inaction. The state's public natural resources, among them its waters, air, flora, fauna, climate, and public lands, are the common property of all the people, including both present and future generations. The state shall serve as trustee of these resources and shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all people. Then it goes on to say that the next step would be a referendum so that the voters could decide whether to add this basic right to our Constitution. The council could support this important human individual right by passing the attached resolution to let our state and county representatives know where Ridgewood stands. By action and inaction, this council is stripping its own residents of our right stated in the Green Amendment being presented. That is a personal attack. I agree with the mayor, starting with you and this council, we can do better. A full-size field means clear-cutting of the seven-acre Shedler parcel, eradicating tree Jackie, green excuse me for just a moment. parcel. Excuse me, if we could all be quiet so that we can all hear the person speaking. Thank you very much. Sorry, continue. Eradicating the tree green filled parcel that filters out light, noise, visual, airborne particulates, gaseous pollutants, and air toxins emitted by diesel trucks and cars from Route 17. At great length, residents have pleaded for the council to follow through on recommendations from professionals, experts, and their very own appointed ad hoc committee to complete independent expert impact studies. Yet you don't. We are completely ignored time and time again. We speak and no one listens. We're told no, time and time again. So I agree, there's no need for personal attacks, but this is becoming one. This is pitting neighbor against neighbor. And we're simply asking that we be respected and be given the same exact rights that you're about to present in front of the council today and the rest of the residents here and those at home under the Green Amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Oh, I'm sorry, one last thing. This resident here asked me if I could please hold her spot because she's way along in her pregnancy and she couldn't stand this whole entire time. It's up to you. I just said I would at least ask because she couldn't wait with standing in line. So she's right By all means. Good evening. My name is Al um, C. Inquits. I actually just recently moved to Ridgewood. I'm sorry, your name again? Uh, Al, like Al Pacino, uh -huh. and my last name is C. Inquits. And nope. if you could give us your address, please? Yes, uh, 321 Vandenberg Avenue. Uh, so I recently just moved into Ridgewood. Welcome, Al. Thank you so much. Um, I'd rather sh I should say I moved back to Ridgewood. Um, I went to middle school and high school here. And I moved out after high school. I lived in New York City for quite some time until recently. And, you know, I was really shocked when I came back to Ridgewood. I got all of this information about what was going on with the park and on our side of Ridgewood. And one of the things I can say is that Ridgewood is by no means lacking in athletic fields, having gone to middle school and high school here. Um, I participated in activities in, in middle school and in high school. Um, so I think that that was my first point. So building this field um, would by no means affect uh, the participants of athleticism in Ridgewood, in my opinion. Um, secondly, what I did notice is a lack of 
uh, walking space um, and really nature grounds for the family it's on our side of Ridgewood. Um, I always believed that when I did live in Ridgewood, when I lived on that si on this side of Ridgewood, um, you know, <laughs> I'm expecting, of course, and I would really love to have some place to walk, um, to have a the ability to have a safe green space for my children to play with, to play in in the future, and that doesn't seem like an option with this field and this turf being an option for um, for this park. And, you know, that really concerns me. Um, there is no walking distance safe area for us. Um, and I think that that should be taken into consideration with our neighbors and with all the people that have families and growing families who are looking to move into Ridgewood. Um, so yeah, that was my, um, that is my opinion on the subject, and uh, I walked over there yesterday. I met a couple of people <laughs> along the way, and I did ask them about it, what their concerns were, and I share those concerns. Um, perhaps not with all of them, but I do share them, and I hope that the council and the mayor can hear what uh, the families that are just moving back into Ridgewood have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Al. Good evening, Michelle Italia, Three Betty Court, Ridgewood, New Jersey. Um, I come tonight as uh, not much as a homeowner, but, a, but as a realtor. And I am a realtor. And I would like the council to ponder the consequences that your decision is going to impact on that part of town. When I have a client that wants to come to Ridgewood, there's a series of questions that they ask me. The first question they ask me is, uh, what school is my child going to go to? Um, is it a quiet street? Um, is there a park nearby? Am I easily accessible to walk to an area? And I have to answer those questions. And depending on the prolocation of the property, I will have to answer yes or no. So if you live in a certain section of Ridgewood, and the first question is, what school? I can give them the choice of the school that their child is going to go to. If I, they ask me a question about the park, I can mention the park and how nice it is to walk around there with their children. If they ask me about the field, the, the, um, the services, how close am I? I could also answer that question depending on where they're looking. And they're, they might ask me about, um, am I close? Is it a lot of noise in the street or in the area? And I could easily answer those questions. Now, depending on the location, and then if there are three houses, and just by chance, one of them happens to be near the Shedler property, what do you think my response was, is going to be when they ask me? And I am being, I, I am selling a property, and I am being honest with my client. So the first question they're going to ask me, what school do, will my children go to? Well, your children, they, there's no school there. You're going to have to, they're going to be bused. And they're going to be bused to this elementary school. Oh, well, what about their social life impacted on them? Well, you'll probably have to drive them to their friends. Or their friends are going to, parents are going to have to drive them over to your house. Okay, then the next question is, well, what about parks? Where would, could, what parks are there? Well, there's no parks. Well, what about, hmm, uh, is there, is the, are, are they quiet streets? Well, some are somewhat, but not really, because there is one thing that they're thinking of building there, which would be a field. And where is the field near? 
Oh, it's right near the highway, and Michelle, you can hear it. Forgive okay, me, your time I'll is up. I'll keep it down. I'm Thank you so um, much. But no, Michelle. Pon I you? know my time is up. I tend to speak a lot uh, and not carry on. But I would like you to consider the fact on property values. When a house doesn't sell, and because all these things are no, the property values are going to go down. People are not willing to buy that house. And people who have to sell that house Michelle. are going to sell it for less. And the taxes to this town Michelle. is going to be less. Thank you very so much. So thank you. Thank you very much. Dana Glazer, 61 Clinton Avenue. Good evening, Dana. Good evening. Uh, so I'm really pleased to see that there are some little leaguers in the room. I think that that's a special thing. I think that any time that we encourage civic behavior is important. Uh, I was talking to my- Dana, if you could speak especially close to the microphone, it, it's it, the, the mask- My voice doesn't carry enough. Yeah. No, Got it's, it. It's the mask. No so worries. Thank you. Is this better? Much better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, as I was talking to my daughter the other day, and she was asking me, what is, what's this thing about Shudler? What, I don't understand it. And I, I try to put it in a simple way, uh, and I think it's useful to say it the same way to the, really direct it towards the kids who are here in the room, which is that in 2017, the Village Council made an agreement with the residents of Shudler about a certain size of baseball field and things that would go into this area. Uh, and, and that, that has changed now. Uh, and my daughter looked at me and she said, oh, you mean they squelched on the deal, Daddy? And I said, yes, that's right. And I think that that's an important thing because you know, more than anything, as a father, uh, as well as a resident here, so much about what we do here is about the transmission of values, of passing values to our children. And I think that this is an important learning lesson for them to understand that while, you know, I love Little League, I, I had a wonderful time as a kid playing Little League, um, but to have a gigantic field that's not, that, that squelches that deal is not, it's not right. Uh, and that they should understand that, that as much as we think that baseball is important, that there are people who are suffering and will be suffering as a result of this. And it's easy because, you know, they're over on the other side of town. We don't, you know, if you live over here, you're like, well, it's over there, you know? But these are our neighbors. And, you know, I don't live over there, but these are our neighbors and they should be treated as such. So I, I would strongly consider, uh, uh, suggest that you look again at what was proposed in 2017, which was reasonable, which they had agreed to, which puts a baseball field there, and bring that back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. Good evening. My name is Christina Million. I live in 530 West Saddle River Road. Um, before I begin with what I wanted to talk about, just to address the issue of flooding, if you file an OPA request, the um, the town engineer has filed for flood insurance on Shedler, so I really don't want to hear that it doesn't flood. It's in a floodplain. Okay, so I'm in support of a small grass field at the historic Shedler property, which is optimized both for speed and it's cost efficient. Tonight, I want to read some headlines, and then I'd like to ask a few questions regarding the consultant you're considering hiring named Peter Primavera. Headline number one, Highland Park-based archeologist is charged for giving false testimony. Headline number two, Prove a perjury charge against archaeologists almost completed. Headline three, the damage has been done. Pulled quotes from these articles. The public loses when the local government behaves as arrogant as it did in the case of a Highland Park consultant who filed false resumes with the state agency and later lied under oath about his credentials. The facts of this shoddy behavior are not in dispute. Primavera listed his credentials in sworn testimony before the New Brunswick Planning Board on a sensitive project, and in both his resumes and in sworn testimony, he claimed to have graduate degrees that he does not have. He claimed to have an archaeology and history degree from Rutgers University. He claimed to have master's degree in the same subjects from Columbia University. 
And the truth is he had a bachelor degree in anthropology from Rutgers University. As New, as New Jersey's historic structures fall before the bulldozer, the public needs to feel secure that archeological consultants advising on what to save and what to destroy have the competency to know the difference and the background to support their opinions. Our heritage is too precious to trust to political expendency." End quote. My questions. Who first proposed to you that you should work with Peter Primavera? How did you adequately vet him? What has been the due diligence to date? What would be Peter's exact mandate for this work? The Department of Environmental Protection follows federal guidelines that states that any archeologist or historian employed on a project that uses federal funds must hold a graduate degree. Have you called the Registrar's Office of Rutgers and Harvard University of Design? Because that's now where he's claiming he has degrees from, a PhD no less, according to a simple Google search. Did you receive written referrals from other towns on his work? How much will Peter potentially cost taxpayers? We know we might not be able to afford to hire more cops to keep our town safe, and we might have to furlough village staff. So how much does this consultant cost? As Peter is not a lawyer, when and where was the RFP posted? And could you please walk us through, through how transparency was prioritized during this process? I'd request that the council stop considering working with the George Santos of the historian world. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Cynthia O'Keefe, 542 West Saddle River Road. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Before I get started, I wanted to note that we pledge allegiance to the flag and we say united we stand. But clearly, we are not standing united here tonight, or have we over the last several months. We all want what I believe everybody wants, which is a small field. But then there's the faction of people who want a large turf field we have come week after week to talk to you about safety concerns that affect the health and well-being of all the residents who live in the community around Shedler. This is going to affect our livelihood. I came here two weeks ago and spoke about the well water. There are five families, some of whom are here tonight, who drink water from those wells. And turf, artificial turf has been known to cause cancer, all kinds of health concerns, there are PFAS that are going to go into the water. That's not really what I wanted to talk about, but it's one of the issues that we bring up time and time again. That is a serious consideration. Safety is a serious consideration. We do not take these things lightly. I would love to bring, if I had kids, I'd bring them here tonight. I have four dogs, and those are the dogs that I walk on West Saddle River Road. And I've almost been hit by a car many times trying to dodge cars that are coming off Route 17 and they're supposed to be deaccelerating to 25 miles an hour and they're not. We also notice that when cars are parked on both sides of the street, there are 11 feet, 11 feet. So we're talking no fire trucks can get down the street, no EMS, so if my house is on fire or any of these people who live in the neighborhood, we are all in jeopardy. How will we mitigate this risk? And I will not sleep until I get those answers. Now, what I wanted to talk to you about is the public benefit, and these are SHPO review standards, okay? So we all know that this, is, this project is supposed to be for the public benefit, and there are three criteria. So the public benefit, whether or not feasible and prudent alternatives were explored and if they exist, and whether or not sufficient measures could be taken to avoid, reduce, or mitigate encroachment. So I'd like to know how is this uh, large turf field for the public benefit. It can't be. It's only serving one group of people. And if they don't care about our health, they only care about having a baseball field to play on, that's pretty sad. United, we do not stand. So we've talked about the, the traffic coming off Route 17. We've given testimony. We've had doctors write in, nonprofit. Everyone's written to you. You've all received letters in your inbox from various agencies historic ones too, that are very concerned that you were destroying this property. And actually, uh, Jackie and I went to the Shadery Committee a couple of weeks ago to talk about all the beautiful trees that are gonna be planted in, in Ridgewood. How does that affect Shedler? You've cut them all down. There are no trees left. It's very sad, and I thank you for your time, and I hope you'll consider these points. Thank you so much.
Fretra, <coughs> excuse me, Fretra De Silva, 521 West Saddle River Road. Good evening, Fretra. Good evening. First, I'll say that I'm in support of a small grass field. Um, key to moving uh, the Shedler project forward in an efficient, timely, and therefore cost-efficient manner is adhering to the standards set by SHIP SHIPO. This, is not, this not only applies to the field, but also to the use of the house. I urge the council to use the historic home in a manner that will preserve the historic character. As we begin the celebration of America 250, the 250th anniversary of this country, let us use this as an opportunity, a unique gift to our children so that they have the knowledge that where they live is where our forefathers stood and took a stand for this country. The U.S. Congress, Governor Murphy, have both allocated funds, millions of dollars, to this celebration. In addition, nonprofits and for-profit uh, organizations have allocated funding for improvements to historic sites like, Sh like Shetler and increased opportunities for children and for people to learn about our history. A center which houses the exhibits, lectures, crafts, and programs celebrating our history would not only be consistent with the character of this 18, the only, apparently, 1820s Dutch frame home in Bergen County, which is fantastic, but would also enhance the recognition of our great history right here in Ridgewood and in this state. Mm -hmm. Grants from the Historic Preservation from Fund, the American Battlefield Protection Program, the Technical Preservation Services, and others would specific, are specifically tailored for this type of project. I would urge the council to really consider these types of alternatives and opportunities for the use of this property and, and this land. Thank you. Thank you, Fretra. Um, this will be our final uh, person for public comment. We have several people um, in the queue for our hybrid access. Hey, Paul, I, I would normally not ask for an exception. I would just note there is a woman with two school-aged children. Normally we ask folks to wait till the end. Given that it's a school night, I don't want to set a precedent, but they've been waiting patiently. And I know we had at least two people whose spots were held, so I think they waited thinking they'd get in, because by my count they would have been 10. So I would ask if the council would agree to a, an exception this one time for the one person waiting with the school-aged children. And here, let's start with, does anyone in line have any problem with that, making that exception of allowing this woman with school-aged children because she really cannot wait until later. Yeah, one of those kids looks like they're about to knock out, so they're not going to make it. <laughs> All good? Great. Great. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. My name is Mike Sanfilippo. I'm at 706 Hillcrest Road. This is my son, Jack. Um, we came directly from uh, one of our first... 8U practices. Um, it was exciting. The boys and girl actually um, pitched to each other and had live batting, live hitting. Um, so it was kind of a, a fun day there. Where was the practice? Um, the practice was at Gaines, which is a facility in Waldwick. The reason that the practice was there is because despite it being you know, a, a, a spring day with 60 degree weather and, and good daylight, there are no fields available at this point. Um, so we have 12 boys, uh, sorry, 11 boys and, and a girl, numerous other players, all in a, a kind of a tight space where they're getting their first experiences and we're not outside. We're not in a field in, in Ridgewood. Um, another anecdote, same day, I have a, a son on the 11U team. We wanted to have a pitching practice. We have one of our first uh, tournaments coming up uh, so we wanted to get some bullpen work in. Snow fields. We actually had a, a, a practice, a bullpen session at one of the coaches' houses because there was just no place to go. Um, third thing, this weekend, we have a <coughs> intra-squad scrimmage, sorry, also with the 11 you guys, uh, where the, the black team, maroon team, and white team, the sort of A, B, and C teams are all going to play each other. It's like a four-hour thing. The, the players are really excited for it. It's set for one of the fields in Ridgewood, but because there's, and this is Sunday, when it's supposed to be nice out, because it is um, likely gonna rain on Saturday, 
everyone is making contingency plans because if it does rain, there's a very good chance that that field is gonna be rendered, the field in Ridgewood we're gonna play on is gonna be rendered unusable. And we are actually have made a backup plan for our team to play Wyckoff in Wyckoff on their turf field. Um, and this is just the last few days. So obviously it's early spring, it rains in early spring, but this is the time when, when you know, the, the players, you know, the boys and girls really are, are making their, their friends and meeting their teammates and starting to really practice. Um, but this sort of thing has happened all throughout the year. I've, I've been coaching for four years at this point. And, you know, I remember in, in the height of summer, it rains and we're at um, Hawes Field for, you know, two hours before the game, lugging in clay and trying to get it fixed. And, and this, the reason is that there, the field, there are not enough fields. Um, the fields that we do have are, you know, they're prone to flooding and need a lot of work and there's just simply not enough turf fields. Um, I understand, you know, I, I'd rather plan grass generally myself, but for part of the year, it's impossible to do so. And the only way that we can get our, you know, our kids outside and playing is, is on turf. So thank you for your time. Mike and Jack, thank you both so much. Hi, my name is Kate Semenak. I live on 356 Devon Court. Um, I know many of you guys are very much against me right now, but I do appreciate you letting me at least give my perspective. Would you, excuse me, as would I've you speak to into all the of, microphone? Thank you so thank much. Thank you for letting me give my perspective as I've listened to all yours. So I'm here in full support of creating turf field at the Shedler property. As a mom, I really do feel so lucky that I'm in a town filled with tons of kids, many of which who just love to be out playing sports. And I don't care what sport, be it baseball, football, soccer, softball. It just, it's awesome. It's awesome to see. However, with that comes the expectation that as a town like Ridgewood, we would have the fields to go along with that enthusiasm for sports and activities to support other towns coming to us to play games. Sure, we have fields, but are they good? No way. Are there enough? I know some people think there are, but there really aren't. I can say that because not only as a mom, but now as the person in charge of Ridgewood softball with the RBSA, I'm telling you I have 21 recreational softball teams right now from first to eighth grade. I have roughly 80 girls being placed onto travel softball teams as I speak right now who want to get out there and start practicing as soon as they can. But the problem is I have zero fields officially allotted to me yet, none, not one. And while there's always multiple reasons to any problem, the glaring one is that fields are hard to come by. The supply is that up to the demand and fields aren't easy to hand out to the different sports. Otherwise, I would have had fields already. Softball is on the low end of the totem pole and more fields, better fields, a turf softball field at Shedler would only help us get those girls out there and play and they're desperate to play, but I don't have any fields to give them right now. Please push this project forward, both as a mom and a person trying to improve and grow an entire softball program in this town. Please give us fields and good fields, weather resistant fields, turf fields. We need good fields. Shedler is a solution and it's a good solution to me. I know some people disagree, it's a good solution to me. The kids deserve to see this project go forward and it just, it simply won't be wasted on them. Not an ounce of it. So thank you so much for your time. And again, thank you for letting me speak, even if you're in disagreement with me. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for allowing her to speak. I really, I really appreciate it, not, not for her position, just because this is how we need to conduct our business here. Thank you. We have several people um, online. Uh, the first one is Susan. Are you there, Susan? Yes, hi. Um, can you hear me? We can, Susan. Good right, evening. Thank you. Your name and address, uh, please. All right. Yes, yeah, Susan Ruan, 705 Kingsbridge Lane. I want to state that I support a small grass field at Shedler, and I would actually employ people to stop using their children as ploys at our heartstrings. Um, next, I would also, um, again, I hear from Westside families that they want to turf Shedler, but yet they will not consider um, turfing Citizens Park. I will graciously disagree with my neighbor, my next door neighbor, that more trees will be cut down 
for a large field in comparison to a small one. Which brings me to um, the SHPO application for the Shedler field and the criteria of whether or not feasible and prudent options, um, alternative options exist. While the council insists that there are, there is a need for more fields because of flooding, there has no specific data demonstrated um, demonstrating the increase of flooding over time. There has been no um, data provided showing the council's review of current fields, improvement and the cost comparison of such activities with destroying shed the historical property of Shedler. No data has been shown to demonstrate the true impact of this field in connection with such um, tremendous needs. <clears throat> you know, until real analysis is conducted and the statements about the increased field um, is simply an expression of a desire and wish list. There really hasn't been any data given or any transparency shown to any of the residents that adding one field will remedy the whole of Ridgewood. Um, <clears throat> the, here are a few facts. No other large field in Ridgewood is adjacent to a state highway and with a clear path to highway pollutants to the players. No other large field in Ridgewood are 50 feet from an exit of a road that has a highway with 55 mile speed limit. No other large field in Ridgewood results in destructive of a destruction of a historical property. There are fields in Ridgewood that are not in flood zones. We would ask the council to pursue um, review <clears throat> to pursue those fields and analyze that makes determination on those fields are vi viable alternatives to the plan currently proposed. Um, <clears throat> the current council, excuse me, the current council adheres to the standards by SHPO to preserve um, to preserve the historic nature of the the fit, um, of the property, and we. We would ask that alternatives be pursued and that the transparency of seeing what the, why those other alternatives are not viable be shared with the public. Susan, thank you. Susan, thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Next yeah. up is Ankit. Uh, Ankit Daria, 471 West Saddle River Road. You guys hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome, Ankit. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to first thank the council to give me the opportunity to present my concerns today. Uh, I, as I mentioned on the last council meeting, I moved into Ridgewood in late 2022 with my family. I live right across the Shedler property and want to reiterate that the concerns that my fellow neighbors have brought to your attention. Two points that I would like to make is, can we, can the council please consider the original plan from 2017? that was previously agreed upon. With the inflation on the rise and possible recession in the near future, the change of scope, the overall scope of what we agreed to, what we are, the council is thinking, will impact the entire village financially. Second, can we do perform the studies that are needed to make sure that there, the new field does not impact the families living in the area? It, could, it includes like traffic studies, noise studies, environmental studies. I have a four-year-old that ready to go to park, but we don't have a park. So having a park is great, but let's not make it, make it a big park where the kids can't go and enjoy. So please do take into consideration of the quiet neighborhood that we moved into. We would like to live in a quiet neighborhood and having a bigger field will impact the residents in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Ankit. Next up is Catherine. Good evening, uh, Catherine Schmidt, 123 South Irving Street. Good evening, Catherine. First, I'm very glad that you are considering the New Jersey Green Amendment, and I look forward to that discussion tonight. Um, secondly, I am um, urging that each of you who are liaisons to village committees check in with those committees on issues that come before the council where those committees have relevant expertise. And I think that Shedler is one of those issues. Um, 
I think we need all the expertise we can get on these things, and these are people who have been appointed by the village to opine on certain things. I was surprised just a few weeks ago when I spoke to friends of mine um, who are on the Historical Preservation Committee and on the Shade Tree Commission, among others, who told me that they had been not asked what they had not been asked by the council what their opinion was. Well, needless to say, I told them that they could form an opinion and tell the council whether the council asked them or not. Um, nevertheless, I do um, ask everybody who is on a committee to reach out to those committees and find out what they think about the Shedler project and roll that into your mix of decision points. And the other one that I would ask if us to reach out to might be the health department. I know we've gotten a lot of input from the um, engineering department and from parks and recs, but I think that the health department also has expertise that we might want to consider. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Catherine. Next up is Ra oh, excuse me. Next up is Alyssa. Hi, good evening. Alyssa Matthews, 941 North Monroe Street. I fully support a small grass field at Shedler. This would be a huge benefit and asset to the entire town, allowing for a great mix of a field, playground, and walking path for all to enjoy. This would fit perfectly in the site and I really, I would have loved to have this when I was raising my daughter in the Shedler area. So please consider the small grass field because that's really what fits at that site. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Next up is Rob. Hi, it's uh, Robert Koch, 60 North Hillside Place. Good evening, Robert. Good evening. I find the uh, credentials of this uh, prospective um, consultant alarming. And I just gotta say, uh, same old thing, stick with the resolution 18 to 236, you'd be much better off. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, Rob. Next up is Denise. Hi, <clears throat> this is Denise Lima, 319 East Glen Ave. Thank you for allowing us to speak this evening. Um, I don't have a lot to say, just a few things that I hope resonate with everybody. Uh, what I am in favor of is maintaining the historic house and the property and not unwinding it. It's uh, an opportunity for us uh, as, a, as a town to really do something great in that area. I'm also in favor of <clears throat> candidates upholding their pledges to voters I'm in favor of lawyers upholding the business code of conduct and ethics and doing the right thing. I'm also in favor of transparency. The last five years I've heard many people uh, in town on the council asking for better transparency. I'm in favor of that as well. I'm also in favor of us all having a conversation, collaboration and compromising. And I don't think we're doing those last five things very well. And I think people feel that they're in the dark. And it starts with, and I've asked this before, how do we define the metrics and what the need is? We've heard people talk about smaller kids, uh, teenage kids, uh, bust the kids, uh, different types of programs, different types of schedules, 50 kids, 100 kids, can't schedule, what, what is the demand uh, and what is this field really going to resolve? What, what is the potential schedule? What are we really facing? I, I, we keep hearing different things. We don't have those facts. And without the facts, which is the basis of, of the demand, of the requirements, of the scope, how do we make any other informed decisions without that basis? Um, Siobhan, uh, I've asked Heather, I've written several times. It's been promised that that information would be put up on the project site for Shedler. Um, I, not only is it not there, I'm not getting any responses. And I think that that needs to start there for people to really understand what the impacts we should be looking at. And so, um, yeah, I just, I just think we have a lot to do here. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Um, that's the end of public comment at the beginning of our meeting. We will have another public comment session at the end.
I want to begin by thanking our IT team that has made our um, public outreach through hybrid access uh, virtually seamless. They've done an excellent job. We've expanded the time for public comment to get as many in as we can. I especially want to thank all of the speakers tonight for voicing their opinions in a respectful fashion. This is obviously a contentious issue with lots of very strong feelings on all sides. So when, when this happens, everyone listens better. So thank you very much. We're hey, going to move well, on. There, there are two people standing. Can we just give them preference when we reopen at the end of the meeting? So Absolutely. You'll be the, if, you, if you stick around, you'll be the first ones at the end of the night. Okay? And I'm cautiously hopeful that it won't be a long agenda. All right? Thank you. Thanks, Evan. And let's move on to our manager's report. Uh, this evening, uh, Heather Malander is, is unavailable, and we'll talk about that later. So we have uh, the very capable Rich Calvi stepping in. Thank you, Mayor. Manager's report for March 22nd. Uh, next council chat is scheduled for Saturday, April 1st, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at Village Hall <laughs> Courtroom here in this room. Call for reservations at 201-670-5500, extension 2207. Walk-ins are welcome, however, reservations have priority. The Ridgewood 2023 drive through Mobile Shredding event is Saturday, April 1st. The event starts at 9 a.m. No early arrivals, please. It ends at 1 p.m. or when the truck is full, whichever comes first. The event takes place at Graydon Pool, 200 Northern Parkway here in Ridgewood. Please stay in your vehicle. No walk-ups allowed. Documents will be securely shredded by IDS Auto Shred. Place items for shredding in a paper bag or cardboard box only. No plastic bags. There's a limit of five file size boxes per vehicle. It's free to all Ridgewood residents and businesses only. The event will take place whether it's rain or shine. In the Health Department, Alzheimer's Association, Greater New Jersey Chapter, along with the Ridgewood Health Department and Parks and Recreation, will host a workshop on COVID-19 and dementia, learn about caregiver tips and resources that can help with legal, medical, and financial matters. It's being held on Thursday, March 30th from 10.30 a.m. to noon in the Annie Susie Youth Lounge at Village Hall, 131 North Maple Avenue. Registration is required through Community Pass, which can be found on the Village website, ridgewoodnj.net slash community pass, or also under the Village Ridgewood Parks and Recreation page. Lunch will be provided. A Ridgewood Senior Bus is also available for transportation, but reservations are required, so please call 201-670-5500 at extension 2203. The Ridgewood Chamber of Commerce presents Easter in the Park at Memorial Park Van Ness Square on Saturday, April 8th from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. Weather permitting, there will be an Easter egg hunt from 11 to 11.15 a.m. And at 11.15 a.m., the Easter Bunny arrives for photos. There will be tables with games and fun, chalk and walk in front of the park, and music by School of Rock from Waldwick. There's lots of fun planned for kids and families. The Village Hall will be closed on Friday, April 7th, in observance of Good Friday. There will be no garbage or recycling pickup on that day. A recycling center will also be closed. Please consult the Village calendar for schedule changes. Yard waste collection begins on Monday, April 10th. Please also check the Village calendar for your schedule of this collection and your area. The RBSA opening day parade will take place on Saturday, April 22nd. The parade will begin at 9 a.m. at the Ridgewood train station and then continue down Ridgewood Avenue to Maple Avenue and end at Veterans Field. The village's annual Earth Day Fair and Daffodil Festival will be held on Sunday, April 23rd from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. The family-friendly event will feature a petting zoo, eco-friendly kids' crafts, games, a magician, and live music at Memorial Park. This year's theme is Ridgewood's Master Plan, a Vehicle for Change. Topics covered will include flood remediation, green building, local health, or drinking water, new recycling concepts, and trees and native plants. Sponsorships and vendor spots are still available, so please contact Ridgewood Parks and Rec 
if you're interested. Village Council upcoming meetings are broadcast live from Village Hall Courtroom on the Village website and Channel 34 on Fios. They're also available on Zoom or by phone or YouTube. Upcoming meetings include March 30th, next Thursday, or Thursday of next week, the Village 2023 Budget Introduction Hearing at 7.30 p.m. April 3rd, a Monday, Village Council Work Session, also at 7.30 p.m. April 12th, which is a Wednesday, Village Council Public Meeting at 7.30 p.m. And then April 26th, also a Wednesday, Village Council Work Session at 7.30 p.m. I just want to let the public know that the Village is currently experiencing some problem with Village email. Um, a select few group of accounts are no longer accessible, but they're being worked on diligently by the IT department, and the hope is that they'll be restored by tomorrow. So if you have emailed someone in the Village and you haven't received a response, uh, we ask that you please be patient. If it's an emergency or you request an urgent response, uh, please call the Village. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Let's move on to Council reports. Siobhan? Sure. So on March 17th, the Access Committee met and we went over a whole range of issues. Um, there's a consistent need for additional employment for the special needs population within Ridgewood. And we had a discussion about potential business ventures that are interested in coming to Ridgewood. Um, they, the Access Committee felt that there needed to be more community awareness regarding access and what they do. Um, we've come up with a loose plan and next month we're going to be partnering with the HSAs through the Federated Organization and looking to establish more outreach and we've invited another business that employs um, special needs population to come in. We had had a field trip with the Rising Above Bakery and we continue to discuss that. I also wanted to let everybody know that the 37th annual Ridgewood Interfaith Holocaust Remembrance Service. The date has been set. It will be Monday, April 17th at 7.30 p.m. and it will be held at the Westside Presbyterian Church. That's it. Thank you. Evan? Uh, nothing to report this week. Lorraine? Thank you. Um, Citizen Safety Advisory Committee met on March 16th. We really didn't have too much to talk about. Our engineer department uh, normally we have somebody from the engineering department and the police department and they both were unable to come last minute. Um, we really rely on them heavily to speak about many of the safety issues. Um, we discussed really the budget for most of the meeting. The members were extremely upset that all of the money that had been budgeted for the West Glen sidewalks have been removed from the budget. So that's a big safety issue for us and we really would like to have sidewalks on West Glen. Um, also, the money was taken out of the budget for East Glen sidewalks as well. So it, it was a very um, long discussion, mostly on the budget. Our next meeting will be April 20th. Um, Project Pride Committee, I wanted to say the planting date for this year for all the flower plot, pots in the downtown will be on Sunday, May 21st. It'll start about 8 o'clock. We're looking for as many volunteers as possible. Last year, we had a lot of people helping, and I think we were in and out in two hours. It was great, and we planted the whole Central Business District. So hopefully, if anybody wants to volunteer, you can email me at uh, lreynolds at ridgewoodnj.net. Um, today, myself, Paul, and former Mayor Knudsen, Susan Knudsen went down to Atlantic City because there was a Municipal Clerks Association of New Jersey conference, which Heather goes to every year. That's why Heather's not here tonight. And unbeknownst to her, Heather was chosen to be Clerk of the Year, which is... <laughs> very, very prestigious award. There are 565 towns in New Jersey. So out of 565 clerks, she was chosen as Clerk of the Year. I think she was extremely surprised, not only to win the award, but to see us there. It was, it was a pleasure to see her um, in her element with all the other clerks in New Jersey who know her and we're congratulating her and you know she is just the best and we are very lucky to have her in our village. 
Um, I also see a lot of people from the signal department here tonight, which is exciting. I don't know if you're here to speak at public comment at the end of the meeting. Um, this meeting shouldn't be too long, and hopefully if you are here to speak, we would love to hear what you have to say. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Lorraine. Pam? I also want to say how pleased I am for Heather Malander to be recognized for all her hard work. I wish I could have been there too. Um, the Central Business District Advisory Committee has met uh, recently and they were questioning whether Chestnut Street and Oak Street will be paved before the pedestrian plaza. So if you could let me know, I would like to let people know about that. Um, also, with a recent accident on Franklin Avenue, they were questioning whether a blinking crossing light could be added to the corner of Chestnut and Franklin, like what we have on Maple Avenue. Um, the pedestrian tunnel art project is proceeding. Uh, we had 30, 30 artists apply to design the mural and we had a jury of volunteers going over the applications and that was really exciting and uh, so we, we picked some of our top choice. I, I did not vote but I, I was watching um, and they picked some of their top choices so the letters will be going out soon. Uh, also, just to let you know, 201 Magazine earlier this month gave out their Best of Bergen Awards and Ridgewood was voted best downtown in Bergen County. So we can all be proud of that. Uh, also, our next, the next meeting of the Central Business District Advisory Committee will be in person in the Senior Lounge on the first floor here on April 13th at 8.30 in the morning. And we will be, uh, there will be a, a presentation about the Chamber of Commerce's five-year strategic plan going forward. And let's see, the Shade Tree Commission met and I sat in for uh, uh, Siobhan Winograd and we reviewed financials that Bob Rooney had given us and um, we were glad to see that there was $169,000 left over in the capital budget. So hopefully we can use that money for planting more trees this year. Also, we spent a lot of time going, revising the bylaws for that committee. The planning board did not meet this week, um, but the subcommittee on implementing the master plan did meet. Um, and let's see, oh, one of the recommendations, the action items in the ma new master plan for the downtown is that merchants should um, uh, arrange for events during the day and during the week to bring more people downtown. And sure enough, uh, World Flats is going to be holding a series of lunch and learn activities. I went to one this week uh, where we learned about um, plant-based protein and, and it was a discussion about healthy eating. And I'm going to be speaking on April 18th at the Lunch and Learn at World Flats on ways to protect our waterways. Let's see, the Open Space Committee met and um, we were looking at what can be implemented from the Open Space Plan that is part of the Master Plan um, and focusing on how to prioritize what should come first. There will be uh, a, um, a table for open space at the Daffodil Festival and Earth Day Fair on April 23rd. And Green Ridgewood is gearing up for exactly that. Um, as uh, Rich Calby said, it's going to be a, a wonderful day, uh, a real family day, and there will be music, exhibitors, um, the petting zoo, and there's also going to be a cahoots contest. If your kids are in high school, they probably know what cahoots is. And there will be prizes for the winner. Um, and let's see. Oh, I wanted to respond to 
uh, public comment. May I do that? By all means. Okay. Uh, with regard to the consultant that we are considering hiring, a resident sent us an article from 1987, was it, about an investigation of this person for perjury. I have not been able to find any criminal complaint, any criminal indictment, um, and an investigation is just an investigation. This one seems to have gone nowhere. I have found nothing in terms of a civil action either. So we're all presumed innocent until found guilty. And if anyone out there has evidence of wrongdoing, please send it to us. We'll read it. But it can't just be a rumor, and it can't just be a smear. And calling somebody a shyster is bordering on defamation. Thank you, Pam. Um, I have no council reports, but today is the first day of Ramadan, and so I would like to wish our Muslim brothers and sisters Ramadan Mubarak, and there will be an iftar this Saturday at the Youth Center at 7.30. All are invited, and anyone who is hungry should come because the food is always amazing at these things. So again, we wish everyone a, a happy Ramadan. Um, and um, today was a delightful day. Um, uh, Lorraine, Susan Knudsen, and I were all in Atlantic City to celebrate the surprise award of Heather Malander uh, receiving the Clerk of the Year Award, which is incredibly prestigious. It is awarded to her and voted on by over 500 of her colleagues. And as I said today, I will say this evening that um, since moving to town 27 years ago, I've seen a dozen or so mayors come and go, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten village managers come and go. We've only had one clerk for more than three decades, and she is there whether we are here or not. And we have been fortunate to have her, and we will be fortunate to have her going forward. And with that, we will begin our agenda. And the first matter up is Ridgewood Water. Rich? Yes, thank you. First item is 9A1, uh, discussion on smart controllers. This is a follow-up from the public hearing of March 8th. Um, that had moved the uh, final approval and the hearing on the ordinance to April 12th. I'm also in receipt of some questions forwarded to me from the village manager regarding ordinance 3940. I'm going to address some of those tonight as well. Uh, but first I want to start with an update on some of the smart controller data. Um, when I last gave some statistics, the 22 year hadn't been closed out as of yet. So now we have that data. So through the end of 22, a total of 398 permits have been issued throughout the four municipalities that Ridgewood Water serves. This represents a, almost about 2% of the system total of the counts. 326 of those accounts were approved through the end of 21. Um, the reason I say that is because we focus on these accounts only because we're able to get their full usage through 22. Anybody that got an account in 22, we have no comparison uh, to compare it against, but we will have that at the end of this year. Of the 326 accounts, 178 remained as the same owner. Uh, and that's important because the permit and usage data is recorded by owner, not by property. So we did the comparison of those 178 accounts. This is similar to what I presented at the last time. And once again, we found that it's about a 50-50 split 87 accounts, or 49% of the total 170 accounts reviewed, reduced their usage upwards of 33%. 91 or 51% increased their usage upwards as high as 76%. Uh, the average decrease was 28%. The average increase was 54%. The count breakdown is primarily in Ridgewood, 152 in Ridgewood, 12 in Glen Rock, 12 in Wyckoff, and 2 in Midland Park. <coughs> 
there are questions uh, around Ordinance 3940, uh, specifically about um, you know how it was created. Um, why don't we limit some of the additional restrictions on smart controllers? So the smart control ordinance was initially created in 2017. Um, it was modeled after the Outdoor Landscape Order Conservation Ordinance prepared by Sustainable New Jersey. In that model, they also restrict water into two days per week and allow exemptions for smart controllers. They don't restrict smart controllers by any day. They allow them to order between midnight and 10 a.m. of any day. The reason that is is because they're relying on the automatic control and weather control for the device and allowing the device to have the most control to do what it's supposed to do. The model is also promoted by New Jersey DEP and US EPA. Uh, the EPA water sense products are, are labeled and defined and those are the only ones we accept. Place cards are given to any permittee um, that is successful in getting a permit for smart controller. Um, they have this placard that we ask that they display. It is not necessary for Richard Water to see this placard on display when we're doing enforcement. We maintain a list of everybody that has a permit. So if we were to hand out a ticket, uh, we're able to cross-reference that and determine if someone has a smart controller. The current revision in front of you is to restrict smart controls to make them consistent time-wise with all other irrigation. Removing the midnight to, 12, midnight to 10 a.m. allowance and bringing it down to 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. This would put smart controllers in line with all other in-ground irrigation, the only exception would be the amount of days. The amount of days it's recommended um, in the comments I received that they be reduced down to four days. Um, I don't recommend this at this time because it's against the New Jersey model. There are other municipalities that have adopted the model. Um, the three that are referenced on the Sustainable New Jersey site, um, I looked at all three of their codes and they do not restrict days and they do allow watering between 12 and 10 a.m. So my recommendation is to proceed with the ordinance as written. Um, you know, certainly down the road, if we find there's a need to further restrict it, we could do what we did last summer and, you know, stop in the middle of the summer and apply additional requirements. That would be my recommendation. Questions, anyone? Um, thank you, Rich. I mean, I, I do, um, I'm thrilled that you're changing the hours from three to seven for smart controllers, but I still have a hard time understanding how you're going to um, catch, for lack of a better word, the people that are not following the smart controllers. If we only allowed the smart controllers on the days that, you know, Tuesday, whatever, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday, then you know, if, then your people who are going out on Monday night and Thursday and Friday night, if their sprinkler is on, they have, you know, violated. It, it's just so much easier. I don't see how, so when your guys go out in the middle of the night, they see a house A and it's, Tuesday night, do they look up every house as they see a sprinkler on? So they, they target neighborhoods based on the days. So you know the days that certain addresses are not supposed to be watering and the times. Mm -hmm. And based on that, that's how they, they go out. And they'll just randomly go out to each block. They, they do it on the basis of what the rules are. Mm -hmm. So now that smart controls will be in the same time frame they'll be looking to make sure no one's watering before 3 a.m. or after 7. No matter, permit, regardless of whether you have it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I mean, I, I appreciate you wanting to follow the same rules that, um, what, what's the name of the, uh, the association or whatever? The it's New Sustainable New Jersey. Sustainable New Jersey. Actually, our ordinance is stricter because we are restricting the time. They True. They midnight to 10 a.m. I would like to revisit this maybe, you know, halfway through the year and see if we can get numbers. If, if we're still only 50% compliant, I would really like to recommend limiting it to the four days that others are allowed to water. I can certainly report back with the same type of information. 
I can update it at that time and we can see what the split of the accounts is. Okay, okay. thank you. Anyone else? Rich, I just want to make sure I understand how smart controllers work, that these are uh, encouraged by the EPA and the DEP because overall they save water, but that there are a handful of people who misuse them. Is that accurate? 51% of the accounts would appear to be misusing them. Misusing them? Yes. And that's a total of how many accounts out of how many? 91 out of 178 based Got on it. the latest data. But we want, excuse me, thank you very much. Um, but we want to we want to encourage more people to use these, don't we? Yes. Okay. I just want to understand. Thank you very much. Anybody else have anything on this? Yeah, I had one question. So, Rich, a notification went out about the pause on the ordinance. When it is passed, you'll let everybody know as well. Yes, we put a pause on all new permits and recertifications pending approval of the ordinance because we we didn't want to approve anything and then have to then go back to the applicants with a change. So will you go back to them after the first reading, or do we have to wait the full time? Have to wait until the, the full approval. The full time. Yes. Okay. Rich, I do find the ordinance hard to understand because it doesn't say what days the smart controllers can run. It's in some set. It's somewhere else. Can it be in the ordinance itself? If you want to restrict the days, otherwise, the way the mechanism or the controller works is it's it's supposed to be tuned into the weather um, some in some cases to, to even soil moisture if they have a soil probe and whether or not they they go as far as programming based on how much of the property gets shade how much gets direct sunlight based on that information the computer inside the control determines then based on the weather pattern knowing if it's going to rain in a couple days whether or not it needs to turn on if it knows it's going to rain tuesday it's not going to turn on saturday or sunday if it hasn't rained for a week, it's going to know it needs to turn on that next day and provide the, the water that the lawn needs. But doesn't the ordinance say that it can be used, uh, that it can run on permissible days? And, yes. And so I'm left thinking, well, what are the permissible days? I think that was probably a typo that was placed in there in the assumption that days might have been put in. Oh, okay. So that, that can be stricken from the, the ordinance. Okay. Anyone else? No. Uh, before we go to our next item, I meant to, in, in uh, my, my council report, uh, just say to the people who are here, I know you guys are here about the furloughs. I want you to know we're still looking at this whole thing. It is not a final decision, and we are trying to find the right balance between how much we can reasonably raise taxes, because taxes will be going up significantly. Um, and and how we can balance our budget here. So um, please be patient with us as we try to work through this. And and by all means, if if you want to talk to us at the end of the night, um, which again hopefully won't be that long, we'd be very happy to hear from you. Thanks. So let's move on to the next matter: New Jersey Infrastructure Bank uh, short-term finance. Try to talk fast. Oh. I, item. Uh, 9C1. Uh, this is um, for award of, I'm sorry, I skipped one. 9A2. Yeah. This is a resolution for the iBank funding for PFOS treatment. Uh, this resolution is required to close the short term loan that's required by the New Jersey Infrastructure Bank that was part of the $42 million long term funding ordinance that was approved by the Council in February. The infrastructure bank requires that we close on the short-term financing or notes that they utilize to fund the project so they give us permission to go out to bid. So this resolution summarizes the process and, and gives the approval necessary to proceed with that. Questions, anyone? Okay. Now 9C1. Uh, this is a word of professional services, um, final design phase for safe routes to school grant. Uh, this design work is part of the final design authorization and modification number one to the DOT grant that the village received on January 31st of 23. NV5 is the consultant for the professional service. They're from Parsippany, New Jersey. 
The amount for the final design services is $141,756.20. This grant is for the design of sidewalk improvements for safe streets to schools. It targets streets that are in the neighborhoods and walking areas to schools within the village. I spoke with the village engineer today. He said it's very urgent that this be passed at the next public meeting. Otherwise, the funding can be in jeopardy. Questions, anyone? Okay, next item is 9C2, award of a contract for road resurfacing repairs. Uh, back in 2020, the village received nine bids for the road resurfacing and repairs. The, bid range, the bids ranged from $2,538,450.91 to $3,242,760.60. The low bidder was American Asphalt and Milling Services. They were awarded a partial award at the time. At this time, we're looking to do a final award and recommend the village engineer is recommending that because it's necessary to release the remaining grant funds from New Jersey DOT. So this is another item he's re recommending for priority because without this approval, um, he cannot get the re release of the final funds. This doesn't authorize any further work. All the work is complete. A uh, resolution will just will allow for the release of the funds from New Jersey DOT. Questions, anyone? Thanks, Rich. Okay, 9C3 is the award of irrigation services for parks and recreation. Bid opening was held on February 15th. One bid was received from the Sprinkler Guy Irrigation Company of Ridgewood, New Jersey. Its recommendation from Parks and Recreation is an initial award of $18,000 for the unit price services for the year 2023. Funding for this award is in the operating budget. Questions? Good. Okay, 9C4. This is the award of Halter Cultural Supplies for Parks and Recreation. A bid opening also on February 15th. One bid was also received. Site One Landscaping Supply of Mawa, New Jersey. Uh, the recommendation is for initial award of $35,500 plus an additional $13,000 for Project Pride. These are unit price items for the year 23 and 24, and the funding is also in the operating budget. Questions? Item 9C5, it says Chestnut Street. Uh, the Street Division of Public Works, the Emergency Escape Stairway. Uh, the Public Works Department had inspection from fire prevention on September 7th of 22. They were cited for not having the means of egress from the rear exit of the building. The doors that go out the rear, rear of the building currently dead end at the railroad embankment, making for an unsafe egress. Quotes were solicit solicited by the Signal Department to install a steel staircase down to the parking lot. If you're familiar with the, the location uh, where these doors exit at the back, they're high above the parking area of Public Works. There will be a steel staircase to now allow employees in the event of emergency to exit out the back and get down to the parking lot very quick. Uh, the recommendation is to award to the low quote of Superior Steel Solutions of Ringwood, New Jersey. The amount is $29,043.43 and this funding is in the existing capital budget. Questions, anyone? Yeah, Rich, would a, a, a simpler fire escape do the same job? Not in, in this location based on the terrain. It, okay. It's not attached to the building. It's coming down the side of the embankment into the parking lot. There's like a large retaining wall oh, there from what I recall. Uh, any other questions? Good. Uh, 91 is the Green Amendment uh, to the state constitution. Uh, this was a recommendation, uh, as mentioned earlier as well, uh, by the Deputy Mayor uh, Perrin. Um, it's to request a resolution to support uh, the state's movement to amend the constitution of the state and put the item on for a referendum for votes. I don't know if the Deputy Mayor wants to add anything to that. Sure. Uh, there are two bills pending, one in the Senate, in New Jersey Senate and one in the Assembly, and they both have bipartisan support for amending the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, to add this particular uh, right. And 
You know, we have our right to free speech and to religion and to bear arms. And what about our right to potable water, to clean air? Um, those, that should be an inalienable right as well. And um, it, this resolution would signal to our representatives uh, in the Assembly and in the Senate that Ridgewood thinks this is a good idea. And our sending this resolution doesn't mean that it will be done, but um, if the measures pass in the legislature, then it goes to a referendum, as Rich said. Um, we have had many environmental laws passed in the last 50 years, and we're still facing a climate crisis. And we're still facing PFAS. And so this fills the gap. And if anybody has any questions, oh, well, there are three states that have passed it, um, Pennsylvania, New York, and Montana. And if anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll address them. I just have a comment. I mean, I, I love this amendment. I think we should do it. But to me, this is completely contradictory to what we're going to do at Shedler. I mean, it says every person has a right to a clean and healthy environment, including pure water, clean air, and ecologically healthy habitats, and the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic qualities of the environment. The state shall not infringe upon these rights by action or inaction. We are going to infringe upon everybody's right if we continue down the field of removing all the trees at Shedler and disturbing the flora, the fauna, the, you know, the water, the, the wells of the people living around there. I just, I mean, this, yes, let's pass it, absolutely, but it seems very hypocritical. Well, I don't see that there is a directive that tells local government, thou shalt not place a turf field in a particular area. I don't see a, 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 uh, a law or any other type of restriction that tells us we can't put in a, so a, a field of a given size. It's not about that. It's about disturbing what's already there. The trees are there. They're hundreds of years old. We should not be disturbing them. The habitats are there. The animals are there. The f flora and fauna is there. We, we should not be disturbing it. We should not be possibly harming people's drinking water by an action that we do. It would be one thing if there was, if it was nothing on the land, but it's already there. The trees are beautiful. I mean, I'm sure you saw the video that um, Patty Infantino sent in at, for October 2022. The trees were gorgeous when they were changing colors. I mean, it would be a crime to take them down. The cases that have come about as a result of the Green Amendment in other states have been things like where a developer or, or um, wants to plant too close to a riparian uh, area and there's already a regulation that says you have to stay within a particular distance and the local body has said, yeah, well, we're going to waive that. Or where there's um, fracking, if, if um, an industry wants to engage in fracking and there's, um, there are restrictions on that or there's a law that limits it in some way and a waiver is granted by the government. Or in Montana, gold mining. It's those kinds of situations where um, the, the uh, litigation has arisen. Well, it's, I'm just reading what it says and to me we are going to be harming the Shedler area in direct contradiction to what the Green Amendment says. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see a contradiction, and I'm still deciding what to do here, but 
you know, but for the village buying this property in 2009 for millions of dollars, it would have been privately developed. And the fact that it's not a strip mall today, I think is a testament to the fact that we did do the right thing and stopped one of the last pieces of green property in Ridgewood from being developed, which was absolutely 100% the right call. So while I know the discussion for Shedler will continue for some time, as it should, I don't see a contradiction between a public a field of some sort, a public space, versus not a public space, given that, again, but for the village's incredibly large investment, made even more palatable this year by the budget cut issues that we're facing, that would be a 7-Eleven right now. That would be a strip mall. And so I think we did the right thing here, and I think we did what was in the spirit of the, of the Green Amendment. So, uh, and and let's, let's, take, let's stay focused on the Green Amendment now. Um, because we could drift into many other areas. So let's continue our discussion of the Green Amendment. Well, so two things. I, uh, I had the pleasure of attending the speaker, and the League of Women voted, Voters has been a big proponent of this, so I fully support it. I, I'm just going to break stride a little bit because the discussion is ensuing. Um, so one of the things about Shedler that's everybody just focuses in on the field, I want to make sure before we, Evan and I joined this council, a disproportionate mm -hmm. amount of trees have already been clear cut. And the other thing is, Lorraine, outside of the field, we're going to need to remove trees to put the path in, put the playground in, and put the parking lot in. So when we have these conversations, and look, I like Evan, we're listening. I think we're all listening. The conversation just gets, it, it can't be this all in and all that. But I believe in the spirit of the Green Amendment. I'm fully here to support it. Guys, I'm going to ask that we really focus on the Green Amendment right now because this is this is what, what's, what's up for discussion. There's, there's lots of discussion that we've had and is coming on Shetler. So let's, let's talk about the Green Amendment. And, and I actually have, uh, first, I, I, I have a comment and a question. I, I think this is terrific. I want to thank Pam for um, shepherding this thing through because I think it's terrific. I just have questions for both you and Matt. Um, in terms of, and, and I'm not as concerned about the village, but just in general, the litigation that this could spawn. Um, tell me about this. I, I know you've both looked at this. Yeah, I was concerned about damages and, and would there be so many lawsuits that it would bankrupt local government. And um, then uh, the person who's, who's spearheading this explained, just like other um, rights in the, Bill of, in the Bill of Rights, you only get equitable relief. It's only um, injunctive relief saying to the government body, you have to do such and such. Would you explain to those listening what equitable and injunctive relief is? Yeah, that is um, a directive to do something or not to do something. It's not money damages. So in other words, if, um, if a municipality is, and I'm just going to pick up, an example is putting something into a local stream, there would be an injunction to stop them from continuing to put something in the local stream. But there's exactly. no, no money damages contemplated with this. Correct. Got it. Thank you. Matt, you have anything to add to that? I don't have anything to add to that, no. Great. Great. Thank you. In, in, in that case, then I have, I, I, I supported this regardless. I personally, um, now I have absolutely no reservations with this. So we're moving ahead with this for the public meeting? Do we yes. have consensus? Anyone opposed to this? Good. Good. Thank you. Our grandchildren will thank us. So next item is 9D2. This is deed notice for the Hudson Garage. Um, in the construction of the Hudson Garage, the village remediated soil um, that was found to be contaminated. Certain areas of the property contain contaminants and concentrations that do not, do not allow unrestricted use on the property as it continues today, such things as a future residential use or a daycare or examples. So it's recommended by the village engineer and recommend and required by the New Jersey DEP and the consultant first environmental to place a deed restriction on the, on the property. Questions, anyone? Good. Okay. And our, our final, final item is 9D3. This is a resolution to accept a gift from the Ridgewood Baseball and Softball Association. Uh, there are two, two different gifts. Uh, the first is the installation of protective padding 
to cover fencing and backstop at Veterans Field at the 60 by 90 foot diamond in the amount of $7,934.82. Uh, the second gift is for repair of pitching mounds at several fields, including Veterans, 90 foot diamond, the Lower Hawes, Habernacle, Citizens Park, uh, totaling $3,750 for a total gift amount of $11,684.82. Questions? No, I want to thank the RB, oh, excuse me, go ahead. Oh yeah, go ahead. I just want to thank the RBSA for their generous donation. This is how we get things done. We all hold hands together, we work together, and we get it done. So thank you, RBSA. I did want to ask Rich, um, the Spring Street Well House, it, was that taken off? Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Yes. That, that'll be back on for next week. We, we pulled it to add an additional site to I it. See. That's, that's all. Great. Thank you. We're going to return to public comment. And uh, my earlier comments about public comment still apply. So um, I believe the two people in the back who are waiting patiently, we really appreciate your patience. First up. First up, um, Diane Baza and John, 109 West Ridgewood Avenue. And the subject that we wanted to talk about were smart controllers, which you um, already um, have addressed. And I'm glad no decision was made on those. So approximately, based on your numbers, there's 326 um, residents. And I'm, uh, we are one of them that um, purchased thousands of dollars of smart controllers we have to get certified, recertified every year, and we were presented, as I'm sure all the other people that have purchased them and put in, I would add tens of thousands of dollars of landscaping based on the fact that we could utilize um, these smart controllers. And um, we have been using them. They work. And like I said, we have to get recertified every single solitary uh, year for them. And I think that, you know, if you're going to accept the science of EPA and state of New Jersey, um, you need to encourage the use of them and not discourage the use of them. And the second thing, based on the numbers that I heard, one thing that I don't understand, when you're doing an, a year-over-year -year analysis, some people have three zones and some people have 13 zones. Some people add zones during the year because they spend more money on landscaping. So I'm not sure how those numbers foot with, with that comment at all. Also, if you have a large yard, if you could just speak into the microphone, thank you. If, you. if you have a large yard and you have invested thousands upon thousands of dollars in landscaping, with the understanding that having a smart controller would let you maintain that landscaping, all of a sudden we're being told that we no longer can use the smart controllers to their optimal use. You're now going to basically put us in the same category as someone who hasn't spent thousands of dollars for a smart controller and basically just has a regular timer. If you truly want to accept what Ridgewood Water is saying, the EPA is saying, and the state is saying, you should encourage the purchase of smart controllers by not equating them with a plain timer. Let them do their job. People who aren't using them to their utilization, their, their fullest, those people should be examined, not the people that are using them to their fullest. Also, if water conservation is truly your main concern, look at where the big use of water comes from, okay? Pool evaporation, 600 gallons per week, okay? People who spend, who fill their pools every year, we're talking tens of thousands of gallons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, and thank you for your patience. Jacqueline Home, 30 Carriage Lane. So at the start of the meeting, we discussed respecting one another, no personal attacks, I agree with that, and I think definitely that has to start by leading with example. So I was very taken aback 
by Councilwoman Perrin's response to a resident threatening a resident with defamation, basically calling that person a liar and then putting the burden of proof on residents. Um, when that resident clearly asked a bunch of questions afterwards saying, what is the vetting process? Because one Google search shows that this person has quite a record, and if you would have done your due diligence and just done a simple Google search, it also shows that Peter Primavera actually admitted to lying and saying things that he shouldn't have said and saying he had degrees when he didn't have them, but I hope that the residents forwards all that to you even though they shouldn't be doing the homework of the village. The village should be vetting their own people. I was at the meeting, uh, shade tree meeting that was mentioned, and it was very alarming to me for a bunch of different reasons. One was that in attending that meeting, yes, I agree, I was there. As Pamela Perrin, Councilwoman, said, the budget was discussed. But what was not mentioned is that the shade tree committee, there was a member of Parks and Recs there, and that person was um, also saying how there's just not enough manpower to take care of the parks and fields and trees that we currently have. So we might have a budget um, with extra money in it right now for trees, but there's no way to water these trees because that staff is going down to two people for the entire village. And as we see on the Shedler property, the berm that was built, those trees aren't being properly watered. And then tonight I see that there's an award contract for irrigation service system services. And I found it really disturbing that in that meeting we can talk about uh, budget cuts and furloughs, but yet we have money to award contracts and it seemed to me that the shortage on one end within our own village and taking away from our own village staff, on the other hand, we do have money to outsource this responsibility to other people. And I, for one, would like to see to keep us in-house. I know that we've spent a lot of money on equipment, we spent a lot of money on training, we have very loyal staff members, here at the Village of Ridgewood that are part of our community. Um, I would consider them neighbors. They're there day in and day out. And I would first take care of them before I would begin to award contracts to outside independent contractors to do the work that our village is here to do and more than capable. There was a lot of talks during that meeting to hire people from doing everything from planting to watering to, um, at one moment, um, Councilwoman Pam Perrin said, at this point we're just wondering if we're going to be able to pick up your garbage on all the days. So why are we then hiring a historic preservation consultant at all, let alone one that seems to have um, a very questionable pass. And why is this something that can be done inside of our village by our own village staff? Why aren't we giving them the opportunity to do these services rather than awarding contracts outside of our village? And certainly why are we building a larger park that is a stark contradiction to the Green Amendment? whether you think that or not, because I don't understand. It seems like there, there, there's no correlation, but there is exactly a correlation. You're removing trees on a very, on a highway that you know has pollutants on it that are affecting health and safety of the residents, but you won't do the studies to prove that right or wrong. I don't think that's good governance. Thank you, Jackie. No furloughs. Um, 
Christina Million, 530 West Saddle River Road. I just wanted to address the, the Councilwoman's comments. You know, I've been doing um, some sort of comms, either in policy or crisis communications, for close to 20 years. And when, when an executive um, misspeaks or makes a mistake, the last thing that you ever want to advise them is to double down on that. And it just really shocks me that instead of properly vetting someone who you have brought into our town and therefore might impact the reputation and integrity of our town, as Jackie pointed out, you're putting the burden of proof on residents. This is not our full-time job. And so my question is, I want my questions answered. I feel like every week we're up here asking questions. We've submitted them formally to Evan. I've emailed you all directly, and we don't have open dialogue, and we don't have our questions answered. The questions are not easy, but we need information and data, just like Denise dialed in and said the same thing. And it's beyond frustrating to me. I just honestly, at the end of the day, I don't understand why it's so hard to hire someone who in these articles admitted that he perjured himself, admitted that he lied, and why is it so hard to find someone who hasn't done that if you want an advisor? Secondly, the crossroads of the American Revolution have written into you expressing concerns. It's a credible organization. Go talk to them. Find your consultant through them. The New Jersey Society of the Sons of the American Revolution have written to you, credible organization. Go write to them. Find a consultant from them. Or talk to America 250. It's a commission that literally Congress has set up to help with historical tourism, and I'm sure that they could easily advise someone who doesn't have this shoddy past. I just fundamentally don't understand why your bar is so low. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. Anyone else? Good evening. My name is Joe DeMarco. I'm a resident at 572 West Saddle River Road. Again, I support the development of a park, including a small grass field, children's playground, and passive area, including walking paths. Two weeks ago, I spoke about two concerns regarding the development of the Shadler property with a full-size artificial turf field, including the higher rate of non-contact injuries and concussions. Tonight, I would like to call your attention to another issue that is coming to light regarding turf fields. This is the issue of PFAS, a term Ridgewood residents have become too familiar with recently due to the high levels of PFAS in our town drinking water. These same forever chemicals are the basis of, for artificial turf. In order to make artificial turf uh, grass blades flexible, the Environmental Responsibility and Ecological Center tested eight different turf samples in 2019, which all tested positive for PFAS. These artificial fields are far from indestructible, though. The International Association for Sports and Leisure Facilities states that mechanical wear from games causes tiny particles and blades of artificial grass to break off amounting to over 600 pounds per year of PFAS laden microparticles to be lofted into the air and eventually washed away into adjacent soil, rivers, storm drains, and in our case, potentially into adjacent neighbors' private water wells. In 2021, the town of Portsmouth, um, New Hampshire, contracted a company to install a PFAS-free field to the astronomical cost of $1.6 million. Despite this, the tested turf had a whopping 135 parts per trillion of PFAS, well above even the antiquated 2016 safety level for PFAS in drinking water established by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which was 70 parts per trillion. Yes, that's nearly double the previous limit and 70 times the new acceptable limits of two to four parts per trillion. There's a lot of talk regarding the acquisition of additional funding for a turf field, but has the council done its due diligence to research artificial turf? How is the council going to ensure that the turf field doesn't contain these harmful chemicals? The components used for artificial turf fields are highly variable and could include other harmful chemicals such as heavy metals, benzene, VOCs, 
and other carcinogens that can affect the long-term health of our kids. Socially responsible governments like the city of Boston have already banned the development of any new artificial turf fields. I ask that all on the council be as forward thinking as Boston's mayor and not install another artificial turf field in Ridgewood. Mayor, when speaking about the upcoming plan for banishing PFAS from our town well water, you claim that Ridgewood will be well ahead of the national curve. I think you need to apply the same sense of urgency regarding turf fields and be ahead of the curve to protect our children from irreversible harm. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Cynthia O'Keefe, 542 West Saddle River Road. While I've never been one for politics, I have gone back and watched a lot of the, the uh, village council meetings, and I found them quite fascinating. And the reason I did so was not to really do that for my own enjoyment, but to get up to speed and find out when the conversation around Shedler really began. There was an ad hoc committee. We all know what happened in the past. And all of a sudden, as of January, things started going in a different direction. And people started talking about regulation, turf field, sports complex, lights, camera, action, the whole shebang. So I went back to the January Village Council meeting. And this is where some of you were sworn in, actually. And I found it really touching because there were a lot of great sentiments that were expressed. So the new Village Council members thank their families for the loving support that they were given, and it made me think about the importance of each of our families, and especially the ones in the Shedler community, because I'm one of them. So while I sit here tonight and I listen to the mom who talked about being a baseball mom with her kids standing by her, and you know that's all she really cares about, what about our families and our health and our safety? All those things have to be taken into consideration, and if I'm going to say it once, I'm going to say it a million times. So some highlights from that village council session were Evan Weitz, who said um, that democracy doesn't work for if good people aren't willing to put themselves out there and run for office. And I think that's great, and I believe that. Um, and that you would ensure that you lived up to the high standards that this community deserves and would work for all of us. So I'll hold you to that. Newly elected uh, VC member Winograd was sworn in with her mom and family standing by. That's very sweet. And I have a mom who's 93. I can hope that I could live that long. And you know, with health and safety issues in my neighborhood, I might not make it to that point. But one of the things you did say was that you wanted to keep your website up to benchmark your campaign promises. And I think that's fabulous. And you clearly stated, when elected, you will promptly work to implement the 2017 plan for Shedler Park with its youth athletic field, not turf and not you know, this sports complex, walking path, and children playscape. Playscape, what does that say to us? That says a nice place for families to bring their kids to play. So um, I think that's fabulous. The other thing you said, which um, I'd also like to hold you to, is that you wanted to make communication and transparency the utmost importance. And we know that there are mistakes being made on a daily basis. And I know you can improve upon that, and I'll hold you to that. Next. Um, you know, I'd like to say that I do believe in listening to Lorraine. She's taken a lot of our um, considerations to heart. And yes, there is a giant elephant in this room, unfortunately. I don't want to be pitted against people that I care about who may be a sports person in town. I think their kids should all have a place to play. And that's why we've said we want a small grass field so that we don't have health and safety concerns in our neighborhood. So I appreciate that, Lorraine, and, and I thank you for your support. Um, Mayor Reggianos, um, you know, you made in that particular um, meeting a lot of sports references, and I think that's great, and lots of people do that. You said, you know, every resident is part of the team and that everyone needs to get off the bench and get into the game. Do you remember that? So uh, I couldn't agree more, and I think that that's exactly what we're doing here. We're here week after week pouring our hearts out to you to try to come to a compromise, to an agreement. And uh, last but not least, um, I wanted to uh, read a quote that I thought was really important 
from Pam Perrin, and she said that um, you need to pay attention to every resident, business owner, and visitor whom you come into contact with and listen until you really understand their issues, and I couldn't agree more. I think that's wonderful, and I hope that that's what's happening here. You went on to remind them that Ridgewood's village staff and employees are their greatest asset, and I think some of those people are here today. So I would agree, no furloughs. Um, you have to look these people in the eye and tell them at ShopRite why they can't buy certain things for their kids when they're online to, and they're, they've been furloughed for five days. So I just don't understand how a large turf field, and we have money for that, how is this for the greater good, and how can we uh, waste precious dollars on the consultant that we talked about earlier. I mean, who, we, who are we as human beings if that's what we are reduced to? It just doesn't make any sense to me, and I am so proud to live here. And, um, you know, I've also come from Bergen County, and I moved back here, here after many years. And so I love it here, and I would like to continue loving it here. So I say no furlough and no turf field. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Good evening again. Ann Loving, 342 South Irving Street. A few weeks ago, I had to give a vocabulary definition. Uh, the word at that time was obsessed. So tonight, the word seems to be shyster. A shyster is a person who is professionally unscrupulous, particularly in the practice of law or politics. It is a dishonest lawyer, businessman, or politician. Someone who acts in a disreputable, unethical, or unscrupulous way, especially in the practice of law or politics. Shyster is a slang word for someone who acts in a disreputable, unethical, or unscrupulous way, especially in the practice of law, sometimes also politics or economics. I stand by what I said about this person that was not vetted, that citizens had to vet. It was on the agenda until late this afternoon, and it was pulled from the agenda, and I think that's because citizens did what you should have done. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Hello, sorry, I'm in my waddle phase. Um, You're doing great, Al. <laughs> thank you, Al uh, Sienkiewicz from 321 Van Emberg Avenue. Um, you know, I'm still fairly new to the to the village, um, and again, I'm going to repeat my sentiments. I'm kind of shocked, right? Because when I lived here as a kid, it was very different perspective, and now after being here for a couple of months, I'm still very surprised. Um, and so, I hope I can be more involved in in the village and in, in my neighbors are saying. Um, and so one of the things that I heard tonight was that the Green Amendment is, is um, exclusive from what we're doing at Shedler. And I think the two are not mutually exclusive, right? They're the same. You can't say, oh, recycling is important and then not recycle, right? So that to me was like an interesting point that I feel like um, should be addressed and that we can't sign a statement saying, oh, yes, Ridgewood supports this Green Amendment and then be like, mm, yeah, but we're going to do our own thing anyway. So I think that that's really important for me to speak about. And, you know, the second thing was that I heard was like, oh, our grandchildren will thank us. And I kind of laughed at that, right, because I don't want my grandchildren to thank me. I want my kid to thank me, right? So... I think that's really where we have to be very conscious of what we do as a town and what we do as citizens of this place because they're not mutually exclusive. If we're going to say we're going to do something, you actually have to do it. Um, so, yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Al. Uh, good evening. Boyd A. Loving, 342 South Irving Street. I'd just like to say, hey, that's great, great news about Heather. The best news I've heard all week. 
and I hope that something more than the announcement here tonight is done for Heather, like perhaps something at the next public meeting, perhaps somebody can issue a press release and a release that Heather doesn't have to write herself that says this happened. This is good news for the village that we have such a great employee and I think we should do something big about it other than again just keeping it in this room that it happened here that mentioned it tonight. So perhaps you can put your differences with Heather aside, those of you who have differences with Heather, and come up with something that we can do to celebrate this momentous occasion for the village of Ridgewood and for Heather Maylander. Thank you very much. Thanks, Boyd. And uh, please forgive me for standing. I, I just need to get the crick out of my back. It is not meant as any disrespect towards anyone. Anyone else? Michelle Italia, 3 Betty Court, Ridgewood. I just wanted to continue um, in reference to um, the Shedler and the marginalization of the whole area and the impact that in the future the decision that you make will impact the property value of the homes in that particular area. If you um, take today and you take a look at five years from now with your plan in action and this field is placed there you lose the chance of creating an area in the town that will be enhanced, will not be enhanced because you removed an important aspect that every um, community likes. Every town likes to know that their town is important and it has a history. And that history goes back um, thousands and hundreds of years, not thousands, but hundreds of years back, and that the land there, and there was something of importance there. And it helps the community. It helps the, the city, the town, to be noted for that. Um, and it does help because if you take a look at homes in which they have an historical um, designation, the property values go up because they want to live near that area. So I see, as a realtor, the possibility that this can be a way to increase the um, value of properties in that area because everybody is going to be proud of having a district there's another house on that street that is trying to get historical um, designation. So you'd have two houses. You could have a whole section that could be in that category. Therefore, when people are moving and people want to go someplace, you can identify, oh, this is the historical area. We have a house here. We have a, a park here. Where, where people, as they have all said, can come. Young people, older people, who have no place to walk, would have a place. And therefore, someone sells the house, the property value of the, that house is going to go up. Let me say, that area is marginalized. As I pointed out before, if, they, if a, a client asks me, is there a school? I say, no, there was a school one time, but now they have to go someplace else. Do you have a park? No, but there's a field there with lights on it and a lot of traffic. Oh, I don't want to go there. So what happens to that homeowner eventually in time? Right now, I could literally spend maybe 200 hours, and I can give you statistics that tells me that the land might be the same, but the exact same house in one area versus another is going to change in value, therefore decreasing the income of the Richwood town. And I'd like you to keep that in mind. Be assertive in the sense of creating something new, an area which could be an historical area. We have two homes. There was another one there that was a possibility. But Ridgewood historically started 
on West Saddle River Road before the railroad came. The homes that were there were really uh, big homes by robber barons who control that whole section. The railroad changes, the highway changes the structure. However, it doesn't have to be that way. And you can make a difference for the betterment of this town. So I'm hoping that you're going to take a very serious look at the consequences of all that has been presented to you in the past couple of weeks. And look at it, not only the health, but that area also has birds and animals that are endangered and therefore are located within the park. No one has considered that at all or has discussed that because everyone had assumed that this was solved. Yes, we are good neighbors. We are asking, we don't want the whole area. We're simply saying we're dividing it. We're giving a field. We're giving you a small field. And that, that should be good enough. So thank you very much. For thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, Rich Tarleton, 10 Bergen Ave, Waldwick, uh, not a resident of Ridgewood. Good uh, evening, Rich. I am a 30-year veteran in the uh, village of Ridgewood DPW. Um, my family does come from here. My grandparents own homes here. Both my parents grew up here in Ridgewood. Sorry. Um, just two points I want to make. Um, one, congratulations to our manager on her award this week. Rich, very proud of her. you're a tall guy. Stay close to the mic. Stay up. Sorry. Congratulations to our manager on her award this week. We're very proud of her. Two, um, I just want to thank the residents that came out here tonight in support of the DPW, supporting those furloughs. Thank you very much. We will do everything that we can do to work with the town. Um, some of us work here. And some of us don't live in Ridgewood. But we're all committed to help the budget process, cut the budget, and do what we can to help Ridgewood. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> Anyone else? And with that, I'm going to close public comment. I want to thank everyone for being so respectful. Uh, this is how we hear what's going on, and we begin to get things going up. I see, however, that we have uh, a couple of people on hybrid access who want to make comments, and I was not paying attention. Forgive me. Susan, you're on. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> I know. You guys want to get home. Um, uh, Susan Ruan, 705 Kingsbridge Lane. And um, thank you for letting me speak. I do support um, the firemen and the other um, and the policemen, and I don't believe that there should be furloughs. Um, I also think that the money that's dedicated and invested in Shedler could go paying for those salaries. As I stated earlier, I do support a small grass field. Um, I thank the council for approving the the Green New Deal, but as Council Member Reynolds tried to point out, there's a contradiction between the Green New Deal's approval and the Shedler property. The Green New Deal has a fundamental right of clean air and water, yet the Village Council is ignoring the pollutants that are going to seep into the private wells um, by placing a turf field there, and the pollutants that are going to be caused by taking down the trees and reducing the air quality because there's no buffer between the homes and a busy highway. I urge the village council to investigate other current fields in Ridgewood that are not in a flood zone. Um, I know I always speak about citizen because everyone from the west side seems to want Shetler developed, but yet won't turf citizen, um, which I don't understand why because they're complaining about citizen all the time. Um, I also urge for more transparency. 
I think a lot of residents are feeling um, that things are being done behind the scenes, but they're not being shared um, openly with people. And if other fields have been investigated and they were concluded that they weren't, they couldn't be adjusted, then that should be shared in the reasons why. Um, and finally, I would like to um, thank Heather because um, she has done a great job and she does need to be recognized for all her hard work. All right, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Next up is Catherine. Uh, good evening again, Catherine Schmidt, 123 South Irving Street. Uh, I'm very happy to hear that we've passed the Green Amendment. And um, while you were talking about it, I wrote down a couple things like waters, trees, PFAs. And, um, you know, we don't have gold mining issues. We don't have riparian rights issues here. Our Green Amendment issues manifest themselves very differently. And so, and, and well, clearly very differently, and one of the ways they manifest themselves in, is in a decision like that of Shedler. I don't see this as just about a legal issue. It's about a congruence issue. It's congruence between what we say and then what we do. And it's not just about the letter of the law. I think it's about the spirit of the law, which is a higher bar than the letter of the law. So it is ironical to me that we would support the Green Amendment and then almost immediately potentially make decisions that fly in the face of what the Green Amendment stands for. So I hope you'll take this stance that we've taken today on the Green Amendment and factor that also into your decisions about what we do at Shedler. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Seeing no one else on public hy hybrid, I am now going to close public comment again, and I will entertain a motion. Uh, before you do, Paul, I just wanted to say a couple things. Sure. Because I, I sense a lot of frustration, and I wanted to add some facts. Um, I just want to be clear, because a, a lot has gone on in the past week. The full council has not met with a consultant, so I'm not entirely sure how that all got out there. I don't know if it's the way people read and notice we have not had a closed session and the full council has not met with a consultant. Um, that being said, if we were to meet with a consultant and we were to make a decision, we would do it in front. I've said this since the beginning, it's, it's Ridgewood is an incredibly hard place to have a discussion because when you go to have the discussion, and you question something, it gets assigned to you. And that, for me, has been a very difficult um, discussion. So when I met with the neighbors, I said, you know, I'm not wedded to lights, and I would probably not be supporting them, and yet there's still the insistence that the full council is exploring lights. Um, the other thing that I want to explain is that the Shedler project has relied heavily on outside consultants. We're still working on the finances, but Connolly and Hickey has been paid just shy of $200,000 for services, which are consulting services and architectural services on the house. So it's, it's not uncommon for the village, particularly with a large capital project, which Shedler is, to use a consultant. So those are just two things um, to clarify. So I hope that adds some context from my perspective. The other thing is I... I feel redundant saying it, but the 2017 plan was turf. It was turf. Um, it keeps being mentioned that it wasn't, and it is turf. And then to the employees, the similarly, the budget process is a process, and there's an ongoing discussion, and I believe our next discussion, where we'll all be there, will be next Thursday, which is the 29th. And, you know... No, it's the 30th. It's the 30th. The 30th. 30th. The 30th. Sorry. I, I don't have my phone up here, so I can't check. Is it at 5? Uh... No, I don't, I don't think it's a budget discussion. I think it's just an introduction. Intr but I'm sure there'll be discussion at that point. So yes. we, one of the things that I want to say, and I'm sorry to keep going, Paul's going to yell at me later, but <laughs> when the budget was first supposed to be introduced, it was supposed to be introduced on the 8th, and we felt that it warranted more attention. And I think all five of us felt that way. So we've extended the discussion time because we understand the severity of it. And again, just for everybody here, I hear the frustration that everyone's frustrated with the conversation. The only way for the five of us to actually legally have a conversation is up here, which is kind of bizarre to begin with. So the next time the budget will be reviewed by all five of us in public, which is required by law, will be next Thursday. Um, so again, this is a work session, and part of that is this is where ideas and collaboration occur, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody had those facts. And lastly, 
the email server is real. You know, if you've sent us an email over the past couple of days, we haven't gone back to you. I'm very, um, I'd like to get back to everybody. I know the rest of the council values that. There is, this isn't a dog ate my homework. There's really been a serious server problem. So emails that have come across over the past three days may have not come to us. So please take the time again and send them. Um, and that's it. So those are just some facts and I hope that helps and I'm sorry for everyone's frustration. Nicole, I'm sorry, just one quick note. Um, for folks who are at home may not know, we do have a number of people, um, village employees here tonight. Uh, they did not speak, but I want you all to know that your presence here is meaningful to us and you've said probably more than, than, than anybody else could have said by showing up to the meeting. Um, so thank you. All good? I will now entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Nope.